Let's pause. Let's pause there for a moment. I mean, that's one of the famous um, um, uh, lines that we know about this book of Amos. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Amos chapter 5 and verse 24. Anybody who finds it can read that for us. It's so well known, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. made it even more famous. Uh, Amos chapter 5 and verse 24. Anybody finds it? Just, just read it out for us. Pat, you got it. Thank you. Okay. If you didn't hear it, let me just read it out again. Thank you, Pat. It says, for those who are watching online, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And this line has been popularized uh, because of this famous speech. And um, the book of Amos, as we're going to find out, it's more about social justice. Of course, there's more to it than just social justice, but that's really what uh, it, um, it's all about. Um, Barney, if you go to the uh, second uh, you know, paragraph under the introduction and you read that. Um. <clears throat> so listen to this. When Amos was active, we want to situate Amos historically. So um, we want you to know when this prophet was active and uh, you know, uh, what he was concerned about during that time. Yes. So... Bonnie, if you read the, um, the second paragraph. Yes. Under the introduction. It's okay, you don't need to, yeah. Thank you. So this is really the context for Amos. Um, we just talked about uh, Amos 5, uh, verse 24, for those who just joined us, uh, which was popularized by Martin Luther King Jr. And, um, you know, uh, most people know this verse. But what is even more fascinating is the time when Amos was on the scene. Uh, as we know, Amos is from Judah, is from the south. But then he found his way North, where he actually was active, where he prophesied. So he and Hosea were two prophets who actually, you know, kind of 8th century prophets who were very active or who were active in Israel, northern kingdom. And then Micah, uh, a contemporary of um, Amos and Hosea, was actually uh, down uh, in Judah. And uh, as you know, Barney read for us, the main... Um, um, item or the main idea that we get from Amos was his passion. He was so much consumed with what was going on within the uh, northern kingdom. And, you know, the last two lines uh, um, in the second paragraph. Amos denounced the socioeconomic structures of Israel and bitterly castigated the decadent uh, opulence, immorality, and the smack piety of the elites. Let's just read a few verses to actually understand this. Uh, first of all, let's look at Amos 1.1, 1, 1, just to uh, uh, let you know that that's, this is where he came from. It's all from scripture. And then we'll go to uh, chapter 10 verses, uh, uh, chapter 7 verses 10 through 16. And I need your help, so please open up your scripture so that you can, you can read um, you know, you know, for, you know, to all of us so that we can hear that. Uh, Amos 1, verse 1. Anybody, anybody got it? Yes, please. Mm -hmm.
Good. So um, the first verse try, tries to kind of put in context when he was active, and we've tried to summarize that. But let's go to um, chapter 7 and look at verses 10 through 16. And again, since you have the mic and we've only got one mic, it looks like we're going to rely on you. <laughs> Through 17, uh, 16. Wow. And you know, it might sound a little bit strange and harsh when you read it, seriously. Uh, but the last line, Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. And we know that was what precisely occurred in 722-21 BC. Israel was overrun by the Assyrians. But what is even more interesting in this passage that we just read was, let's go back to verse 14. When Amos, you know, was this Amaziah, a court prophet, you know, and as you know, it was actually during this time that we had this distinction between a true prophet and a false prophet. A court prophet who always kind of, you know, uh, did what the king wanted. You know, they obviously... Uh, didn't want to cross the king because that's how they end their, their living, their bread. And they, they were not always speaking what God wanted the king to hear. Remember, the role of a prophet was to be the conscience of the king, was to actually kind of tell the king that this is not right. This is going contrary to the covenant stipulations of Yahweh as enshrined in the And so that was... The, the work of a prophet. And so you can see here, Amos is doing exactly that. Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. In fact, he kind of demurs, you know, you know saying, I wasn't even born a prophet. Uh, I, I'm not from the, that pedigree at all. But listen to this. Nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore, uh, sycamore figs. I was a farmer. I was a shepherd. I was a herder. This is the order. And then one day the Lord just called me. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said, this is what I want you to do. And so Amos is telling us what a prophet does. A prophet is a mouthpiece of Yahweh. A prophet, I've explained this to you before, is not necessarily one who foretells, but one who forth, F-O-R-T-H, who tells us as is. And so here, he's saying to us, look at the last part of verse 15. The Lord took me and said to me, go, prophesy to my people, Israel. How dare you contradict, bless you, the word that has come from Yahweh. How dare you do that? I'm Isaiah, because these are not my words. The Lord called me, and he put these words in my mouth, and he asked me to go and share this with his people. And so this is where you get this other prophecy against this prophet. So I want you to see that 
it's not just out of context when you hear these very scathing and some, somehow uncomfortable prophecy against Amaziah and his family. Why would you know, God do that? But Amos is saying, you ought to be careful because uh, you don't oppose God's word. The least you can do is just to be quiet, but don't just stand up against God's word. I didn't just come here on my own volition. God called me and put his words in my mouth. So just hear the word of the Lord. I think this is what prophecy is all about. So my question is, do we still have the prophetic voice? I want us to talk about it. Do we still today have the prophetic voice? If you say, Roger, you're nodding your head. I'm going to give Roger the mic. Let's, let's hear from Roger. Roger, before, you know, he, he's nodding his head. He said, yes, explain to us. I just want to hear you. Yes. <laughs> say it again. We certainly to do. How? How, how? how do we see it or how is it? translated into we kind of, you know, action where people can understand and see that we still have the prophetic word in our midst. And that's a good point. Yeah, a variety of ways. Can we identify some of the ways in which we still continue to experience the prophetic voice. Let us hear from uh, among ourselves. What are some of the ways? Roger is right that there are a variety of ways in which God speaks. In fact, one of the ways in which we hear God's voice is through God's creation. We know that. Another one is through the Bible, God's word. There are several, there are, you know, variety of ways in which the prophetic word is still active. Any other ways in which we experience or encounter the prophetic word in our midst? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, tell, yes. Just blew your mind. Yeah, I think the the, the Hubble, you know, you know, uh, you know, telescope just gave us something yeah. that revealed something that was so science. extraordinary. Yeah. Science, yeah. science reveals this prophetic voice. It's one aspect of it, and through science we see the beauty and the awesome, you know, nature of God. A God who made, who spoke, and things came to be. So, Amaziah, how dare you contradict this God? The prophetic voice is still here. Thank you. Any other ways in which we see or experience the prophetic voice within our generation or within our time? It's really important because otherwise when we study the Bible, it's kind of, you know, out there. Sometime it happened. Uh, we can, but what's the, how does it really apply to us? How does it make, you know, in our own existence, how does it make sense, you know, to us? Yes, Roger. And that is a fact. Any other way in which we experience the prophetic voice? Don't we? Yes. Yeah. yeah, let's give it to him. Yes, please, because we want the uh, virtual audience to hear that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm in total agreement that, you know, the wonders of the heaven and the majesty of the earth could all, you know, point to the creator, but I experienced that myself 100%. Yeah. 
but you know, the question was, do we have prophecy happening uh, today? Let me get you some water. And you know, anytime that there's a prophet who comes along, it's, it's a false prophet, right? We see all the false leaders, and they say, yeah. you know, hail Bob Thomas. You know, uh, you're going to be taken up in a spaceship. It's all in Satan's mouth. <laughs> It's a good point. Uh, you know, Roger's hand is up. So, Roger, you, you want to uh, speak to that? But that's a good point. Yeah, please give it to, you know, Roger. Oh, okay. So, I, I yes. I right. say when I, uh, uh, I guess it was three years ago, I, I was on the mall with a bunch of Christians. They were led by uh, uh, Graham, the son. And, uh, we walked past all the memorials and the Capitol and all because we were concerned about right. the election. And uh, so there was a, a guy on the stage, I forget his name, but he's kind of like a prophet, a Christian prophet, mm -hmm. and that he was using revelations and the other aspects of the Bible to uh, prophesize what's going to happen to this world, mm -hmm. to this country. And uh, he's right, <laughs> because we are in bad shape. And uh, we all know that. Something's wrong. And so, um, so they're around. They just don't get all the notoriety like maybe Billy Graham did or some of these other famous uh, preachers that mm. appear on television and so forth. But this guy uh, that I'm referring to that was on stage there, during that same time, um, basically prophesized what's going to happen. Right. Uh, I think the, que yeah, th the question on the floor right now is, I think what I said at the beginning. So how do we make a distinction between a true prophet of God right now and a false prophet? And there's so many yeah. that come uh, speaking in God's name. And, and of course, we have some... Um, uh, ways of actually kind of uh, uh, a way of judging whether somebody is a true prophet or a false prophet. You know, by their fruits, you will know them. You know, if the prophet, what he says, comes to pass and all of that. There are several things that we, you know. But you also realize that with, even within the Christian church, there are so many prophets who claim to be speaking on behalf of God. You don't need to go very far. I drive from here to uh, uh, Stafford, towards Fredericksburg. And on my way, as you get close from Lawton going, and if you just make your way out to Woodbridge, you see Apostle so 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 you know name on 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 there, and then uh, uh, Prophet so so and so, and they all claim to be prophets, apostles who are speaking for God. And uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't have the answer. So that's why your question is really, really interesting. And maybe you can throw some light on that. I don't have an answer. How do we distinguish that? Yes, we need the prophetic voice. It is still here today. But how do we make sure that this person is really a prophet? We just saw one, a Messiah, an Amos, right there. So how do we make that distinction? That's your question. They were lucky. It happened.
It is. Nobody would doubt that. But I think another thing, another identifying mark of a true prophet, in addition to some of the things we talked about, what he says comes true, is it, in, you know, does it relate to God's word? It's also their own lifestyle. And we know today that Christianity has become a commercial kind of thing where people go in to make money. And you know, there are so many churches growing up, springing up all over the place, and the, the main objective is for the apostle or the prophet or the pastor, whatever his or her name is, is to make money. And I don't know, you probably are immune because we live in a sophisticated culture, but you just have to travel a little bit away from here. Well, well there you go. I know you may even say, Pastor Daniel, that's not even true. It happens right here. But go to South America, go to Africa, go to, and people, it's just outrageous how many people claim to be God's prophets speaking for God and the things that they do. And they still have a large following. I mean, not too far, you know, long ago, you know what happened? Jim Jones, Waco, Texas, you know, here in America. And these were prophets, you know, people that said they spoke. David Koresh said he was the Messiah. He was, you know, King David in a way. He was God's son. And we know also saw what happened at Waco, Texas. Jim Jones lacing that with cyanide for his followers to drink. And, and, uh, and so it keeps going on and on. Uh, but how do, we, how do we make that distinction? It is a slippery, you know, you know it's a road that leads, you know, uh, sometimes to a place where I can't, don't have the answer for that. But I think all that we have to do as believers is just to open our eyes, just like Amos and Amaziah, and to know that there are false prophets about. There are people who are prepared to contradict or to kind of uh, speak against God's word in a way that is not in conformity with God's word. And I think we just need to be aware. Uh, there's no one solution to this question. It's just something that all that I can say is we need to open our eyes. Anybody wants to speak to, to this? How we can uh, make that distinction, how we can try and help ourselves and help one another. One other way in which um, the distinction becomes interesting for us is when we study God's word in community, it's really important. These false prophets, what they do is they isolate themselves and then suddenly they just come on, burst on the scene and then they say, this is it, God has told me this. But if we study God's word in community, then we will compare what they're saying with what we are sharing together. Because as we come together and we share and we bring our ideas together, we sharpen one another. We encourage one another. Because studying in community was what really happened when, uh, you know, uh, the Bible was first introduced or God's word came into being. It was actually, nobody had God's word as we had it. They only had manuscripts and only uh, maybe a trained scribe could read it to a whole congregation because people, you know, they couldn't uh, uh, print up, you know, these things. They were all manual, handwritten. Uh, but they read it, you know, together and they shared this, you know, together. And I think during that time, you know, they were able to understand God's word even better than we do today. We all have our Bibles. Everybody, we have several Bibles, different versions, different translations. But do we really understand God's word? So studying together in community is a very, very useful way of doing that. Any other thoughts on this before we move on to, uh, 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 you asked a question, uh, do you have any other reflections on it for us? No, he doesn't. <laughs> any, any other uh, you know, comments on this? He's talking about the community. Yes. They did not. Here. Yes. And depending on the person presenting it. Yes. And that's true. And we don't have that person presenting. We have the Bible. We do. And how do we interpret it? Or when God says, you need to understand this stuff. Hmm. Sort of an ethnic no basis. Do you really think? That's a good point. 
That's a good point. Again, all these things are. So what do we do when you have the Bible? I have the Bible. How do we read it? How do we understand the Bible? Now, that also comes with some risk. Because, because you know, we have the Bible. You don't teach me the Bible. Now, you know, there's no need to even go to seminary and study. Because I have the Bible. You know, we all have the Bible, so we can study. You know, you know that line of argument. So there's also that idea there. Yes, Roger. Well, uh, there's numerous reports of particularly Muslims where uh, they're seeing visions and dreams of revealing Jesus Christ as the true, as the true prophet. Hmm. So that's one on the way. Hmm. So visions and dreams another, introducing another uh, you know, dimensional aspect to this discussion. Do we, do, do, you know, do we believe in visions and dreams? Okay. Well, that's another discussion that we can have another time. Uh, we can, you know, the Urim and, 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 and Thummim and uh, visions and dreams and oracles and all those things the, these are words that, you know, thrown about in Scripture. I think we need to study them at some point. Let me just go on and talk a little bit about the message of Amos, just for the next five or so minutes. Uh, if you look on your handout, the focus of Amos is first on Yahweh, the Lord. And the Lord is understood as the creator God, the one who spoke things came into being, you know, the creative word. And so God is creator. But more than that, he's sovereign, the word sovereignty. It's a, it's a, it's a very uh, versatile and, 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 and rich biblical term. God, the sovereign. In other words, you can question God, just like what, you know, Jeremiah and others talk, you know, uh, the clay and the potter, you know, how can the clay ask, you know, why are you making me into this? Well, you're in the hands of, you know, the one who is able to mold. And so God is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, he is sovereign over all nations and also over history. Uh, and God's word thunders. It roars. Uh, that's kind of a metaphor, a way of saying when God speaks, things begin to happen. When God speaks, we need to sit up and hear God. And so part of what God is trying to say to the people of Israel here is, you know, when you go through the uh, minor prophets, the 12 minor prophets, you will come across this recurring phrase, thus saith the Lord in the King James. The Lord says, or the Lord declares. Because he is sovereign, he speaks. And we don't question. That's what Amos was trying to convey to Amaziah. How dare you contradict? How dare you try and kind of rubbish God's word? When what God is saying is that he is the sovereign one. When he speaks, when he thunders, when he roars, you just like a lion. You need to, you know, you know listen. And so Amos prepares them and then he comes to something that he wants to convey to them. So look at under the message, the second paragraph. Can somebody read that for us? Uh, Barney, do you have the mic? Uh, if you can read, um, uh, please just follow you know, Barney under the um, um, second paragraph uh, on the message uh, on your handout, and let's discuss this together. Second, the fundamental obligation Yahweh places on his people is that they practice justice and righteousness. Right. Amos spoke against the unfair social system that allowed the rich to trample on the basic rights of the poor. While some members of the community had been marginalized, almost losing their land and homes, others were cultivating and enjoying considerable luxury. Mm. Amos indicts those responsible for this situation. In this social accusation, however, Amos is not concerned with the principle of equality. No. His accusation is not against wealth or the rich as such. He understands that it is normal for a community to contain both rich and poor. Rather, he is against the obvious evils and destructive influences 
that have forced their way into the relationship between the rich and the poor. Mm. In general, the message of Amos, which is typical of the minor, minor prophets, moves from judgment to promise, from destruction to restoration, from doom to hope. Thank you. So I've tried to summarize for you this important message that Martin Luther King Jr. took and actually made something big out of that when he quoted 524. That was just kind of a, 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 a summary of all that he was talking about because it was the civil rights movement and the book to turn to was Amos and of course Micah, but more you know, particularly you know, Amos. Now turn with me to Amos chapter uh, 5 verse 7 uh, and then verse 24 and 6, 12 uh, as you see on your handouts. Let me read that. Amos chapter 5 verse 7 all you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. Justice, righteousness. And then look at verse 24 of the same cha chapter, chapter 5. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Look at chapter 6 and verse 12. Do horses run on rocks? There's one plow where a uh, uh, plow there with oxen. But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. Why is Amos focusing and kind of really talking more about justice, righteousness? Let me give you one response to that. In the Bible, God is a God of justice. There's no question about it. He's also, his name, Jeremiah talks about it. His name is righteousness. A God of justice and a God of righteousness. There's nothing that we can do in our lives to, uh, uh, if you like, to cancel this. Justice and righteousness. And so what Amos does is to flesh it out. What does justice actually mean? And what does righteousness mean? And so he's using this within the context of relationships, covenant. And he's saying, how do we treat one another? There were those who have been pushed to the margins, to the point or to the brink of losing their homes and uh, their daily bread. And Amos is saying, that's not the way God wants us to. In fact, if you go back to the law, God is more concerned about the orphan, the, the widow, the, you know, uh, the childless, you, you name it. This is really what God is concerned about. This is real Christianity when we take care of those who have no voice, those who uh, have been marginalized, those that have been cast out by society. And if you didn't know, uh, Israel, just like our time now, was a society uh, that was almost divided. You had those who had, you know, the means, you know, wealth, and they were living well. And in fact, Amos talks more about how they even go and weigh, they adjust the scales so that when the poor comes to buy, the poor has to spend all the money that they have, and then it, it's, it was just chaos. And so Amos talks about this. And so let's um, uh, look at a few verses again. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 15. Amos chapter 3 and verse 15. Now the rich have built for themselves winter homes or summer homes, just as we do here uh, in the winter. We will fly out there and just go and enjoy ourselves. And so look at what Amos is saying about that in 3.15. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house and the houses of ivory shall perish and the great houses shall come to an end. Chapter 5, verse 11. A few of that, let me just sound these out for you. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewed stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink from their wine. 
For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, you take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. You know, God is not happy. And so God calls upon them. Look at verse 14. Turn away, seek good, not evil, so that you may live. So that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as God has promised. And so Amos is telling them that it's not good. Let me read the last one, chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. Again, follow me. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, and the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Carner and see, and from there go to Hamath the great, and go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? Verse 4, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches, eat lambs from the flock and cows from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, like David invent for themselves the instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with forest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those to go into exile, and the reverie of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. You know, God is not happy when we ignore those who don't have anything. Finally, I just want you, to, I want to leave with you as I, we bring this discussion to a close. You have my outline. You can look at it. Amos presents this again in, you know, by way of uh, poetry, uh, metaphors, uh, and he uses uh, this prophetic uh, um, way of trying to communicate his message to you know, them. And so you can uh, you know, read about this, you know, different types of genre that he uses, um, just like uh, Isaiah and, and Amos, all of that to suggest to them that God is not happy with the way they are treating you know, people. Uh, let me read uh, on page one, uh, number one. Chapters one to two constitute an oracle against the nations, a genre similar to Isaiah and Ezekiel, where Yahweh's full sovereignty over all nations is expressed. These oracles de depict God's inter international range of activity. Now, Amos 9 and, uh, of course, to the end. All the nations are guilty of violating the norms of human society, particularly in the context of warfare, where you know, genocide, fratricide, and violation of basic rights for proper burial of the non-combatant dead are rampant. It must hold the rulers responsible for the evils of the world. Both Judah and Israel, the people of God, are on the same footing as other nations that will soon come, to, uh, come under divine judgment. God has expressed the same morality from them all. In other words, God is a God of all nations. And so you see some of these words that I've used here as uh, we bring our time to a close you know, um, in the context of warfare, where genocide, fratricide, violation of basic rights, you know, you know, these things are not new. God speaks about them even within the context of Israel. And I think uh, United Nations is strong on some of these things because these are all part of the things that I think we need to be uh, careful about. And so let me conclude uh, in, the, in the end, as you uh, uh, read this book, God is going to restore his people. This is one of the things about the minor prophetic literature. Judgment and restoration. This is the good thing about the God we serve. God does not just abandon us or leave us there when we sin. This is what makes Christianity unique from other religions. While we sin and God is not happy about us, 
God doesn't just leave us or abandon us. There is this road to restoration. And so look at uh, the last uh, part. Can somebody read Amos chapter 9? Uh, again, yes, uh, uh, Bonnie, from verse 11 to verse 15 to conclude for us. Amos 9, 11 to 15, the restoration of Israel. Just follow this as Bonnie reads it out for us. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will re repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, mm -hmm. so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Thank you. Beautiful. Any thoughts on this as we bring our time to a close? Yahweh is going to restore his people, even though they've sinned and God is not happy with them. But God does not abandon us. This is one thing that the minor prophetic uh, books offer to us. I want you to leave this place knowing that you are not abandoned by God. No matter what happens, we serve a God who, like the prodigal son uh, dad, it's always out there, but I'll stretch arm, always waiting for us to come back to him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Unless anybody has a comment or question, let's pray together. Father, you are the sovereign God, the creator one, the one who thunders and roars like the lion and the king of the forest. For you are the creator God who holds this world in your hands. Thank you for the book of Ramos for its emphasis on socioeconomic balance that you want us to have in our, our world, the greediness. Sometimes, Father, just, uh, just pushing people out. Help us to be mindful, to just receive your blessings and be conduits through which your blessings will also flow out to others. Help us, Father, to also be mindful of what constitutes a true prophet, even within our generation? Give us insights into your word, Father, as we continue to study and continue to dig deeper. And so now as we prepare ourselves for our fellowship time and also to transition to our worship service, we pray that you will be with us and uh, just nourish us in your word and bless our time together. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you all, and thank you, our, our virtual audience. Uh, next uh, week, we'll